Thank you for coming. <clears throat> so yesterday I devoted uh, to a uh, condensed uh, discussion on, on multi-scale aspects, and today I would like to take a step back, <coughs> and I will end again uh, with a multi-scale aspects of um, the alignment dynamics. But I will have a chance now to, to open up a little bit the, the presentation, which I couldn't do yesterday because I, I wanted to focus on the, on the multi-scale aspect. So the, the main aspect here is, uh, as I describe alignment dynamics and I give an overview, is really this issue of pressure. Somehow pressure um, is, is not handled uh, in the literature for the last 15 years, and this is the task that I wanted to do in the last couple of years. So let me tell you what the story is. I'm using it as an excuse to describe what is going on. So this is the hydrodynamic description that we ended up uh, yesterday. So we have density, we have the momentum, and we really focus on the momentum here, and there are two terms on red. One is the pressure, uh, which I will derive again today. Um, it's given here, it's a tensor, and there is the alignment term, uh, which, which capture the, the main aspects of alignment dynamics. So I will denote by S the support of the density, and uh, I will assume that the density is bounded away from, the, uh, uh, from vacuum. So this means that we have a blob of uh, crowd, and uh, this blob stays bounded away in the density from zero. It's, it's discontinuous at the boundary. Okay. Oh, these two? This happened to me. Okay. Okay, I have to be here. So the alignment term, let me remind you, it uh, involves a um, communication kernel, phi, which I will assume to be symmetric. This essentially uh, represents the tendency to align. The uh, velocity here is at the point position x. This is uh, pair one, and it interacts with all the other pairs. And the canonical example for pair two is uh, a pair with velocity u at position uh, x prime. And we have to weight it by the local uh, mass. And um, Alignment is a key ingredient in the emergent phenomena in collective dynamics. And the uh, dynamics is essentially dictated by this communication kernel. That's the key element that I did not have time to elaborate uh, yesterday. I just told you it's a kernel and it's symmetric and let's see what's going on. Okay. Okay. Now, what about the pressure? There's this pressure that um, appears there and most of the literature assumes that it has a monokinetic closure because it de describes the thermodynamics for large crowd. And the, the truth of the matter is that there is no clear understanding what should be the thermodynamics of a large crowd in the case of collective dynamics. That, that's the main difficulty that we are facing. Okay. Um, so let's take, first of all, the case of mono, it's called monokinetic closure when there is no pressure. If there is no pressure, then the momentum can be uh, divided through the density, and we get the usual transport equation for the velocity balanced by this is the alignment term. And we will assume that there is a global smooth solution. I use tau throughout this lecture to denote the intensity, the amplitude of the alignment. Okay? Here's a simple example. Let's take phi to be identically one, just in order to get a sense of what's going on. If phi is identically one, what you get on the right hand side, you basically get the density integrated against uh, u here. So you pull out the mass, which is conserved in time. So I denote it by m. And basically we get u m times the average of u minus u. The average of u is given here. This is the average velocity. So this is a simple relaxation. And the simple relaxation drives the whole dynamics towards the average velocity u bar. That's it. Very simple. This is in the case that the communication is one, is uniform everywhere. Now, let's take a not so simple example. Let's take the case that phi is not uh, a uniformly one, but it's just a characteristic function of a small ball of radius r. So just a small change 
And you can see what happens now, you get local averaging. So at every point, you compare the velocity with local averaging. And now you ask yourself, what is the large time behavior? And the answer is, I don't know. It's considerably more complicated just because you localize the, the, the interaction. And then in between these two cases, what you have, here's an in between two cases, you take a phi, which is slowly decreasing as a function of the distance. So it's not a characteristic function of the ball, it's something which is slowly decreasing. And the big question is, what is the large time behavior of the velocity? And this is a simple question because we just have the alignment uh, uh, plays a role here, and we do not know what the pressure, because somehow I still did not say anything about the pressure, because I don't know. So I took the pressure in this case to be zero. Okay, now um, we know that this hydrodynamic description is in fact the large crowds description for uh, agent base model, uh, which is a paradigm for pairwise interactions. So here is what we discussed yesterday. We have agents, and they are identified with properties. And the properties uh, I will quantify by a vector wi. In the typical case that we thought before yesterday, uh, the properties were the velocities. But in fact, alignment appealed to a much wider range of phenomena. So we will denote not by V, but by W, the properties or the traits of these agents, and the change of time in time of these properties is given by this, let's call it a weighted balance between my property and the property of my neighbor, and the key element it is that this is weighted by phi ij, some symmetric weights which depends on the positions or the property themselves or what have you. So this is the basic paradigm in many of the models for uh, alignment. Okay. So we have n agents, we have the properties, we have scaling, and we have positions. And now the pairwise interactions, we assume that the phi ij is a sum function symmetric of the positions xi and xj. I still have to connect the x, the positions, and the traits together. Okay. So agent I interacts with its neighbors, and the canonical, there are many canonical examples which are relevant, and I took now the liberty, because I have more time, to bring some canonical examples from across different disciplines in science. And all these disciplines fall, follow, follows, um, fall under the general uh, statement that active matter steering towards environmental averaging. So the key words here, environmental averaging, describe what's going on here. So this comes from the physics literature. Okay, so let me uh, now make a detour and give you several examples that I will not explore further, but just in order to intrigue you where these examples come from different corners in science. So here's the first example for alignment dynamics. This example is the, the dynamics of opinions. So the WI, the, tra the traits are P, these are, if you want, scalars, and these are the opinions, let's say numbers between uh, 0 and 10. And in this model, which is called the bounded confidence model, after Krauss and Hexelman, the idea is that we change our opinion by taking an average of the difference between our opinion and the opinions of our neighbors, only the neighbors which, whose opinion, let's say, is at most one away from ours. Very simple model. This is an alignment model, because we try to align to the average of opinion of our neighbors, which is a reasonable model, even though simplistic, uh, for opinion dynamics, right? You try to adjust your opinion to the average of opinion of your, your neighbors. So this model, uh, the bounded confidence model, what we see here is, of course, that the communication kernel is simply the characteristic function of the unit ball with its radius one. Let's go. Okay, so here I wrote it in the usual way. So you see that the weights, phi ij, are simply uh, the characteristic function of the ball of radius one. Very simplistic model. And uh, uh, it ignited hundreds of papers trying to address the question, what is the large time behavior in this model? So the large time behavior, here's an example. This is time. 
Here is the distribution of opinions from zero to 10. And you can see that there are agents with opinions one, one and a half, two, two and, th two and three quarters, and what have you. And of course, each two agents whose distance does not exceed one, they mingle together and try to average out. And as you can see that as you go in time, with this characteristic function, as you go in time, even though the opinions here have a sort of uniform distribution, over time, they separate into two, four separate groups that do not communicate because the distance here is greater than one. And the question is why? And the question, in fact, is in general, what is the large time behavior for this kind of models? And I want to say two comments. First of all, the general answer for emergence of four parties in this case, namely there is no consensus. They do not come into the same opinion. The general question is open, even in this simple model. And the reason that it is open, that's more interesting from a mathematical point of view, what is so difficult? The difficulty is this communication kernel which ha is having compact support. And from now on, I will try to avoid models with compact support because there is not a general theory. That's number one. And number two, this model, uh, I always uh, I have an opportunity to say, even though it steered uh, hundreds of papers, I think it's not realistic. So yesterday, Yao uh, gave a talk and she said, well, I love the mathematical beauty of the PKS, even though it's not a faithful description. So let me now take an opposing point of view. Uh, I also like the mathematical beauty, but this is not a realistic model. Just think for yourself. When you come to a crowd, do you change your opinion all the time, depending on the average of opinions of your neighbors? It's not true. At the very least, you have conviction, which is sort of a filtering how you process opinions. The trouble is, how do we model uh, conviction? That's a, di a different story. OK, so this is the first model for opinion dynamics, which is an alignment model. The second model is a pedestrian or sensor-based motion. This is very reasonable. The idea is that we have a state space of positions, not of opinions. Here they are. And we change our position according to a weighted average of the positions of our neighbors. So the way you should think about it is when you walk and you see a crowd and you want to go from A to B, you somehow take the average position of your immediate neighbors. That's basically what is going on there. And the question is, is it true that over time everybody takes the same direction? Why doesn't it? OK. So there is the interaction, which depends, of course, on the distance. We assume that the phi ij depends on the distance, which is not always the case. It turns out that the dependence on the distance is not realistic. It turns out that by measurements, the way that we interact, if I want to go from here to there, is not depending on the distance, it, depending, it, it depends on the crowdedness. Very reasonable. If I want to go from A to B, I would like to see how crowded is the region between A to B. If it's too crowded, I go slower. If it's less crowded, then I go faster. And the crowdedness depends now on the number of agents or the measure between on some, on some um, domain enclosed by Xi and Xj. So here's an example where the interaction is symmetric, but this is not metric. OK. I don't know why it doesn't do this. Anyhow, so the question, here, here's a canonical question that is being asked in, the, in computer science. It's a long story why it's computer science. And not, okay, anyhow, so the question is, suppose you start with a crowd. How can you guarantee that this crowd, let's say, of, sen or of robots or sensor-based will come together at the same time at the same point? That's not e easy to, to, to do. So in general, the answer is negative. Here is an example. You can, start, you can see a general um, crowd here. And they come together, and they create clusters which is the equivalent of what we had before, parties of opinions. But you see, they still get to come together. But at a certain point, we get the steady state, and this is it. And again, the main issue is here is that the communication kernel has compact support. Once the communication kernel has compact support, everything depends on the connectivity that I discussed yesterday. And it's not clear whether the um, communication is connected, yes or no. So this is the second example, pedestrian or sensor-based motions. In fact, if you take phi of r, the, con the, connect, uh, the, the 
communication kernel to be one over R, precisely one over R, then it guarantees that you will always come together at the same time, at the same point, which is interesting. Okay, fine. So this is the second example. Here's the third example. The third example is completely different, and I learned about it only in recent uh, last two years. And uh, the state space is not positions, it's not opinions, but it's rating. It goes after uh, the ELO rating system. So ELO was an American-Hungarian physicist, and he was uh, interested in chess, and he wanted to create a system to rate the chess player. How do you rate the chess player? And the idea is like that. The idea is that you have a zero-sum game with random outcome SIJ. SIJ is the outcome when uh, agent I and agent J play. The result is the plus one or minus one. And of course, SIJ plus SJI equal to zero. And now the question is, how do you change the rating of agent I? Clearly, the rating change each time there's interaction for agent I with all the other agents. So here's the rule. You take a weighted average. Let me skip here. I, I, I have to, 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 to mollify a little bit the statement here. You take a weighted average. Here's the phi ij. This is, the phi ij is a function of the difference of the ratings. Of course, there is a difference if I play chess with uh, the, the world champion or someone who is, is just an average player. So it's important. The, the difference in the ratings is important. And here's this communication or influence function. And this weighted average is an average between WJ and WI. I am player with a rating I. This is a player with a rating J. And now I take this weighted average in order to contribute to either I increase or decrease my average, plus this random outcome, whether or not I just won or lost. And the important thing here, so this, this is basically the LO rating system. I don't know if you know that. I did not. But this is not some uh, Kakemike example because uh, this is the actual rating system that you get for tennis player, for FIFA playing. And here, in fact, um, uh, table tennis, here, are in fact, the different phi's adopted uh, by uh, different organizations. So this is really what's being used. What is interesting here, what caught my attention is, you see that the difference here, WJ minus WI, it's not true. This is not the model. They did not take the difference of the ratings. They took, they took some odd function of the difference of the ratings. And in fact, the whole theory of alignment does not depend just on the difference of the ratings. All you need is the oddness. So I will come back to that, because this will be a major tool that I will use later on. In fact, this is what ignites me to use this tool. OK, just a second. Wow. OK, so the idea is that uh, the expected value of the outcome, here, here's what we would like to have. Suppose that the expected value of the outcomes of player i and player j uh, is the difference between row i and row j. This re reflects the strengths of me versus my neighbors. You would like to see, you expect to see that these dynamics eventually will lead to the case where wi approaches my strength. That, that's basically the statement. And indeed, this was uh, recently uh, dealt uh, by Jaban and his co-authors and, and other people. So an interesting model. And um, I will not elaborate any further. But I just wanted to bring something which is a little bit the unusual suspect. It's not about pedestrians or opinions. OK. The fourth model uh, is swarming. So this model was introduced by Vikshek. And this is the model that drives most of the physics literature. So the physics literature, I, I described to you the social um, literature uh, with uh, the bounded confidence model. And then. Um, the pedestrian models, which is a lot in the computer science and, and, and so forth. The swarming model, this model drives a lot of the physics literature. And this is, in this case, what we have is a state of orientations. We do not have velocities. We assume that the velocity in this model, assume that the velocity is fixed. 
And then the question is that you get the so-called birds and they change their orientation at every moment. How do they change their orientation? They change their orientation by taking a weighted average in, of the difference of orientations. So what does it mean if they take the difference of the orientations? Then they get, and this is the weight, and the weight, of course, depends on the distance. Of course, when you do this sum, this is not something that stays on the unit um, disk. So you take essentially a projection, which keeps it on the unit disk, and then you put a noise. And uh, here is, again, the interaction function, which is the characteristic uh, function of, uh, say, the unit ball. And then the positions is determined by the orientation times the speed, which is fixed once and for all. There are questions whether or not how faithful this model uh, is in the sense that you enforce a fixed speed. However, the physics literature is full with analysis for this model because it has phase transition depending on the size of the amplitude of the, the noise. Okay. Yeah. So depending on the, the, the amplitude of the noise, there is a phase transition from global alignment to homogeneous disorder. This is something that I've I essentially have shown you uh, uh, yesterday. I cannot cover the whole literature here, but you have to assume, that, uh, to believe me, that if you, you, you go after this uh, paper by Vikshek from 1995, you find in application all over ecology, and I don't know to what degree, I don't know, per time we'll talk about it, or, or other people will, will talk about it. So, so this is a very influential model that I will not discuss in this talk. The reason is that I would like to talk uh, about model for flocking, which goes after Cooker and Smale, which was introduced in 2007, and this is the model that is dominant in the mathematical literature. And the reason that it's dominant in the mathematical literature, because we can say much more mathematically than we can say in the model of uh, Vikshek. And this is what uh, we discussed yesterday, essentially, right? That we have a influence function or communication kernel, and now the state of space is space of velocities. Okay, fine. And um, the idea is that this um, communication kernel as it was introduced originally in Crooker and Smale, is some function that decreases as the distance gets further and further, say it decreases of order eta. Of course, this is also not faithful. It's not true that the interaction between two birds continues forever. It's much more realistic to take an interaction function like that. This interaction says that the interaction stops, let's say it's based on vision or some other senses, it stops at a finite distance with certain amount, and in fact, we maybe want even to restrict it to a certain cone of vision. So why don't we do this? Well, the answer that we don't do this is because it's very hard. Again, because it's compact support. And I know of no analysis in this case. Here's the, another example coming from a completely different corner that I will not discuss, but still I would like just to intrigue you in order to show you the richness of different phenomena of alignment, and this goes under the name of synchronization. So synchronization, this model was introduced uh, by Kuramoto, and in fact, even before that, by Winfrey. And uh, if you want to see the, the whole literature, I mean, you can follow uh, many works of Ha and his colleagues. Now the state space is space of phases. So you, you, you think that there are clocks and it has phase, uh, which are denoted by theta i, and the idea is that you change the phase by taking a weighted average. So you ask yourself, where is the, where is the weighted average? Aha! You divide and multiply by theta j minus theta i, and you get that phi ij is the sine relative uh, ratio that is given here. The point is that everything also is ignited by some internal, um, uh, internal, um, what should I say? phases, omega i, which you can think of as random, so that their average is zero, and you would like to see what is the behavior of the system. So again, there is a whole theory that's going on there, and the, the, there is a question between the, there is a competition between the randomness here, this, this drives the system to be um, decoherent, and this tries to coherent the system in trying, in trying to, to make it uh, aligned, and you measure this coherence by this parameter r, which is the sum of e to the i theta j. 
And now the question is, if R is close to zero, basically you get equidistribution, and uh, if R is approximately one, then you get synchronization. You see, if R is approximately one, essentially it reflects the fact that all the theta ij, all the theta j are aligned in the same direction. So you have this kind of transition. Now, as before, I can talk until tomorrow, but one movie will, will describe it best, better than what I can, will not do. And you can see that for different parameters, I mean, you see that the, the case that you get uh, co full coherence on the right, semi-coherent in the middle, and lack of coherence on the left. So the question of synchronization is by itself uh, requires a completely different department. Uh, I just bring it here in order to connect all the dots and to show you that in general alignment, has its footprint in different corners. Okay. Let me go back now to Cooker and Smail because that's what I would like to focus. So we have this Cooker and Smail model. We have this uh, uh, influence or communication kernel. Uh, we have the alignment of velocities. And we know that when phi is identically one, it's relaxation. And uh, we are thinking of something in between. I must say that in this case of um, Cooker and Smale and the other models, uh, the large time behavior is very simple. Nothing can come out except for the fact that the limiting velocity is just the total average. So it's very simplistic because alignment in this, in this version is, um, is naked. There, there is nothing else. So the only thing you can find is some global invariance. So you can see Basically, what we expect is to get alignment of this, of this nature, that we get just something which is straight line. Of course, where we want to get is, uh, we want to get this. I will try to comment on the distance between where we are and where we should get. I mean, th this is really what drives a lot of these models for flocking, but we are not that far from there now. I'll explain later. Okay, so the most important thing in, in these alignment models is this function phi. This is by far the most important. Let me tell you about different classes of phi because depending on the different classes, I can say something which is of value. So here are the different classes that cover the whole literature, depending on the communication kernel. The first class, is the long range tail metric kernels. So this is the class that we saw before in Cooker and Smale. The interaction depends on the metric distance and it just has a long tail. The second class is a short range with finite tail. For example, the characteristic function of a ball. And I already indicated that there is almost no theory about short tail interactions, even though this is the realistic model. The third model is phenomenological head. That is, it's exactly what we have in the long range tail, but notice that in this case, we get singularity when X and X prime are very close. And this singularity indicates that there is a strong preference for the immediate neighbors. So this is important. I, here, I do not look uh, at the tail, I look at the head. Of course, it has a tail which is very thin because this is the dimension plus a positive number. And here, eta is any finite number and as we shall see, it should be less than one. So this is a very thin, thinner tail than what we have there, but it has a singular head. Another model that we will the, uh, we will see that comes on in a natural way is when the communication kernel is not scalar, but in fact a matrix. So, for example, if it is the Hessian of some uh, convex function, so we get a matrix, and this is fundamentally different than all these cases, simply because now when we have a matrix, then there is a um, interaction between different components of the dynamics. And finally, there is this topological uh, interaction where the interaction depends not on the metric, but on the crowdedness between two points. So in some sense, this, this covers all the different examples that I know of uh, for different communication kernels. And we would like to be able to say something which is um, 
relevant in these different cases. We will be able to say something in all these cases. I will put the, the case of short-range interactions aside. I will not cover it in this talk. Yes. Any number. I will come to that. It's, it's any, okay, so the singular case, the singularity means that it is a function of the distance which is larger than the dimension. But I wrote it in that manner that it's the dimension plus 2sp, s is between 0 and 1, and p is anything. Just wait a second and you will see. I had to write it in this manner. There is a reason. Okay. Now, um, where did this communication kernel come from? In the meantime, I just play with the mathematics, but what is their origin? So let me tell you. The metric kernel is just phenomenological. We just impose that the interaction depends on the metric. So this is number one. And I, I wrote be, be, below uh, the sources. Where do they come from? A lot of the, the, the cases come from observations. For example, uh, the topological kernels. Um, they came from ob observing the starlings in the Rome train station. You see that I put here the name Parisi. You know, Parisi uh, won last year the Nobel Prize, and he did many things. Among the things that he did was actually a series of works with um, a large group about the collective dynamics of starlings in, the, uh, in Rome train station. And then in human crowds, so there is a reference here uh, of people who actually measured how human crowds interact, and it turns out that they interact depending on the crowdedness. So these are topological kernels. Random based protocols, I just mentioned the ELO rating. In the ELO rating, the interaction is essentially random based. Another source uh, for, for these kernels is uh, they, they, are learned, they are learned from the data. So we are now at this stage of dataism. Everything is machine learning and so forth. There are many works where they see the outcome and they start to learn what the phi is depending on the outcome. And then another source for, for this communication kernel is some higher order principles. At the end, I just told you, here's an alignment. Who said? Where, where does it come from? So what are the higher order principles? So there, there is a minimum entropy principle and there is another um, example of anticipation. So this brings me to discuss one example where there is a systematic derivation of all these models and this is anticipation. So as an example for higher order principles, uh, I would like to, to, to discuss this, this idea. So the, 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 the idea with anticipation is the following you get this um, system which is almost Hamiltonians with a twist. So you get the potential U and um, the interaction, the velocities react to the gradient of this sum of the potentials of the difference between Xi and Xj. X are simply the positions, almost the positions. So you see, the, the statement here is that we change our velocity not according to the positions, but the position anticipated in a little while. So if the position the time t are xi, a little while is xi plus tau times the velocity. And where tau is a small positive number. And that's the difference between particles, where the interaction is immediate, and the expectation where um, we have agents that uh, probe the environment. By probing the environment, they react to what they anticipate, the anticipated scenario will be in a little while, a time t plus tau. So this is how this system looks. Now, if you um, open the system and you, you, if you expand it, so anticipation I, I just mentioned here is it's really an essential aspect of social dynamics. If you expand this system, I don't know, it's strange. Okay, so now I, I uh, expand the system in tau when tau is a small parameter. So the first order term when tau equal to zero, I just take the gradient of i uh, of u of xi minus xj. U, this is the distance, so the gradient with respect to i gives us this term, which is given here. 
And now, depending if U prime is negative, we get repulsion. If U prime is positive, we get um, attraction. So this is familiar from start, start from from uh, um, standard uh, particle dynamics. So in some sense, it's very important, but I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in the new aspect. And here's the new aspect. When I take the second term, when I expand the second term, lo and behold, yeah, lo and behold. Let's do it like that. It's much simpler. When I take the second term, all of a sudden I get not only the gradient of the potential, but I will get the Hessian of the potential, and the Hessian of the potential over there, which is now denoted by capital Phi, so this is the Hessian of the potential, and this Hessian of the potential, which is a matrix, acts on the difference of velocities. And for the first time, we see that in systematic manner, we get an alignment term, namely the statement that we change the velocity depending on the difference of velocities with the coef matrix coefficients, and then we get attraction and repulsion. So it's the first time that we see that there is interaction of three terms, re attraction, repulsion, and alignment. Okay. Yeah, I have to get used to this stuff. So we can see that anticipation aligns velocities and enhances, enhances clustering uh, of positions. Now, yes? <laughs> if I knew that, then if I knew that, then it would be wonderful. Uh, I'll show you in a second. So your question is somehow you always ask the, the, the question at the heart of matter. This is really the most fundamental question. Which, which term dominant? Let me refine it slightly. The question is, which term dominant for the long, large time behavior? That's what we are really interested, right? For the large time behavior, which term is dominant? And the point is that the answer is complicated because the repulsion um, um, does not compete, but it fights against the other thing. And the, the repulsion is the most complicated aspect. Now, when you have alignment and attraction, then um, they, um, uh, they work together. We will see that in a second. We will see that in a second. Okay. Okay. So this model, where you have repulsion, attraction, and alignment, was in fact introduced in 1987 by uh, Craig Reynolds. And uh, when he wanted to get a realistic description simulation for flocking of what he called boids, Birds, ob birds like objects. And uh, if you want to see to your question, the role of alignment, so now let's see the role of alignment, repulsion, and attraction. For those of you who saw it already, I'm sorry. So what you see here, these voids, they are now driven by these three forces. And yeah, as you can see, this is pretty realistic model for birds because they really align, they do not impinge on each other, and they do not disperse. They, they go together and they create this kind of uh, blob, which I call flocks, and they move in time, right? They are governed by three forces, repulsion, attraction, and now we turn off alignment. It's just repulsion and attraction. And when it's repulsion and attraction, well, they go randomly and they either collide or they repel. This is clearly not realistic simulation for flocking. So what we see in this example is that alignment plays a critical role in making the dynamics realistic, which is precisely the reason that from now on I will put aside repulsion and attraction and I would like to, in, to focus on alignment. And that's what we have done yesterday. We just talked about alignment. I never said, why do I talk about alignment? Now I do. I talk about alignment because this is the main mechanism to drive the dynamics in a realistic fashion. Of course, we have to address the question, what happens that when the three of them come together? And this is still open. And you can see now um, the alignment comes back. And again, you get this kind of, uh, it's, not the, 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 it's not that it's beautiful, but it's, uh, Faithful. Okay. And I mentioned that many times that uh, this uh, simulation 
uh, actually uh, awarded uh, Craig Reynolds the Oscar for a scientific animation in 1998. Okay. So, we are now in the business of alignment. I finish now with this very long introduction. I try to intrigue you why alignment is important, and now I'm coming back to the mathematical aspect. The question is, if we just have alignment, what is the large time behavior of this model? And I know that the only thing that can occur in this simple case will be that everything will approach the global average. If you add repulsion and attraction, then it becomes much more complicated, which I put aside. Okay, so here is the, uh, our favorite um, uh, cooker and smell. And you see that I wrote the cooker and smell in, in, in peculiar way. Instead of writing phi ij vj minus vi, I wrote it as, as follows. I write phi ij minus the sum of phi ik delta ij times vj. So I wrote this matrix as a one matrix acts on vj. Check it and you see that it's correct. So instead of looking at the average of differences, of fluctuations, I see that the change of VI is related to all the VJs by this kind of matrix. And this matrix is exactly what I discussed yesterday. This is the graph Laplacian. So graph Laplacian appears everywhere, and it appears also here. So this essentially, this matrix is the graph Laplacian, and... Basically, what we have, therefore, if we have the vi dot equals the sum of j, a matrix times vj, I can abbreviate and say that v dot equals minus the graph Laplacian, v, and don't worry about the minus because the graph Laplacian is defined as a positive quantity in computer science. There is nothing you can do about that. So this is the graph Laplacian. You see it over there. And basically, what we have here is just the heat equation. What can be simpler than the heat equation? However... There is a slight delicacy here because the Laplacian or the graph Laplacian depends on phi and phi, phi ij, which depends, uh, the phi ij depends now on the positions and the positions depends on the velocities and in short, it's a nonlinear heat equation. So we have to be careful. Nothing of what we can usually do in the heat equation works except few things. And uh, the, the one thing that we can do here is look at the eigenvalues for the graph Laplacian. So what we do is that we look at the fluctuation for the velocity. So let me do it here, because once and for all, this is important. Uh, so, um, so this is our problem. Essentially, we do L2 energy estimates. And we multiply this by vi, and then we sum. And then what we get here is that ddt, if I define now delta e to be the sum of vi squared, let's take here 1 half. In fact, let's take here 1 over 2n. So we scale it correctly. So if uh, I, I call this delta e, then what we get here on the um, right hand side, we get um, tau, we get uh, an extra n, right? And uh, we get the double sum of i and j, of phi i j, and then we get the inner product vj vi, inner product with vi. That's exactly what Yao talked yesterday in her talk. That, I mean, this is uh, not um, semi negative. However, because of the symmetry, we can change the i and the j. We assume that this is symmetric. And then we get that this is tau n squared, the double sum. Again, phi ij. But now we get vi minus vj times vj. And when we sum these two terms together, we get that this is, we take the average. We get that this is tau 2n squared minus the sum phi ij vi minus vj squared. And this is exactly what we met yesterday. In fact, you wonder, why do I call this the delta E? Why do I call this, why this is not the energy? I do not call this the energy because I already know that the only quantity that matters here are fluctuations. So you can see the delta E that I put there is not exactly what is written here. Uh, what happens there, I, I denote upstairs the delta E 
is one over two n squared is the double sum of vi minus vj squared. And I know that you object because this thing and that thing are not, do not agree. True, but the rate of change agree. Why? Because when you sum this, you get that this is n times the sum of vi squared plus n times the sum of vj squared just by opening this. And then you get in the middle, you get uh, the sum of vi in a product with the sum of the vj's, right? I'm just talking about this sum. And you see what happens, these two terms add up to exactly what is written here, right? And this term, well, the sum of the vi, so you can see an immediate observation is that if I look at the equation, I sum the vi's, the right hand side is odd, so the sum of the vi's is conserved. And you remember, the only thing I need is the oddness. So indeed, the sum of the vi is conserved, so the rate of change of this is zero. So you can see that instead of looking at the energy, I look at the fluctuations. That's the only quantity that matters, fluctuations. And I end up with what is written on the, uh, on the top, that the, uh, at the last line here, namely that the, the rate of change of the fluctuation is bounded by what? Well, we get here, um, we get here the sum of phi ij vi minus vj squared. This is exactly what we met yesterday. The only thing I want to do is to pull the phi ij outside and to say, well, what should I pay? And we know what should we do, and we know what is the best thing to do. You pull out the second eigenvalue of the graph Laplacian times the fluctuations. So we get a statement that the fluctuations decay. Not that the energy decays, the fluctuations of the velocities decay. Okay. Hmm. Um, yeah, I don't know what to do with... Okay. Anyhow, so once we get this statement here, we just look at Gronwell, and it clearly, if the second eigenvalue here uh, is, um, has an infinite tail, then we know, namely, if we have a heavy tail graph, then the fluctuation decays to zero, and it means that the velocity will approach their average because it's invariant in time. So why do we need heavy tail? Because, for example, if you take phi, which decays, in, uh, which decays like uh, uh, power eta, we need eta to be less than one because this tail is non-integrable. We need the communication, the interaction to be strong enough so that the integral of the second eigenvalue is infinite. And in this case, the diameter is covered here. I'm sorry, I don't know how to get rid of this mess. So the diameter stays bounded, and then we get flocking. Okay, so this is the example of flocking or long time behavior for alignment dynamics. This is the basic stuff in the discrete case and in the, um, the same thing in the dynamic description. So now we move to the last crowd dynamics. This is something which I already covered um, yesterday to a certain degree. So uh, let me finish just this last crowd dynamics. Here is the agent based description, and we want to move from this to the case where n tends to infinity. We look at the empirical distribution, and you and I know that this one over n in front of it is in fact the statement that we assume that all the agents have the same mass, which is one over n, which of course does not sustain itself in time because we get mass distribution. So in fact, we have to redo everything assuming that there are different kinds of mass concentrations, which I will not do because I would like to look at the case that there is only one flock with one uh, time scale. So this is basically preceding everything that I've done yesterday. And then the large crowd dynamics is realized, assuming that this limit exists, by taking the first two moments of the empirical distributions, which I denote by the density and the momentum. And here we are of what uh, uh, we get here by essentially integrating the Vlasov equation. Okay. So this is exactly the point that I started the lecture. And I just say that uh, the pressure itself is given, so I have to write this because this is important. We finally come to the pressure. So assuming that there is indeed uh, 
a limiting uh, distribution F, and uh, here I will take the, the um, alignment which has to do with F and F prime, and then when we integrate this against V, then we will get here that rho ut plus uh, we get the integral of uh, a grad x uh, f v cross v dv and here we will get the alignment term and the question is what to do with the closure for this flux term of course this problem is not has nothing to do with alignment this problem exists there because it exists for many years in the passage from the kinetic to the hydrodynamic description. It has nothing to do now with the alignment. And when we go now from the uh, uh, kinetic to the macroscopic description, uh, you can see the problem is that um, we have somehow to close the second moment of F. And if we will close the second moment, we will take the second moment here, then we will need the third moment, and there is a problem of closure. And the way it's being done at the end is that um, that's what I've written yesterday. Um, I make a closure, but by rewriting the V cross V in terms of bilinear form involving U, and then I'm left with taking the moment, which is V minus U, V minus U transpose times Fn, taking the limit. So this is, in fact, inside the integral, there is a rank one matrix. When you integrate dV, you get a general matrix, which we call the pressure which has to do with the uh, thermodynamics of the problem. And we will not solve it here because we have to have information from the outside. I just want to mention another thing which is important. So let me put here the pressure. So this is the gradient of x, rho u cross u, plus the pressure. And the pressure is given by the integral v minus u, v minus u transpose, Fn T X V D V. We assume that there is a limit for that. And if you take the trace of this rank one matrix, then you get um, the, um, the internal energy. So one half, if you take one half the limit of that, So this is the definition of the, um, the, the, the internal energy. Okay. And the internal energy measures the fluctuation. This is a scalar quantity measures the fluctuation between the kinetic level and the macroscopic velocity. The question is, what is this pressure? This remains open. I don't know because this is not a hydrodynamic description. It's still, if I write this equation in this fashion and the P is given here, it's unclosed. Okay. And this is the problem that I would like to discuss. So how people are uh, closing this? So the canonical example is assuming that we know what is the large time behavior, what is the large time hydrodynamics, namely, let's just assume that Fn approaches the density times the Dirac mass at the macroscopic velocity, let's say. In this case, the internal energy, is simply, if you take this ansatz and you plug it here, then you get that the internal energy is zero, so there is no pressure. If there is no pressure, this is the pressureless model, and this is exactly what I showed you yesterday. In fact, uh, if you remember yesterday, this is the pressureless model for Vikshek uh, agent-based description. So on the left side, the left hand side, you get the agent based description. On the right hand side, you get the dynamic description with no pressure for the Vikshik model. That's basically what you see here. Many people, as I mentioned, uh, worked on this passage uh, trying to find different closure for the pressure. Let me just uh, a few more minutes finally address the question is what about the pressure? So what is really going on? So we have a system now for rho, for u, and for p. And it's not clear. The p is given here. That's the best statement I can tell you, but I don't know what is the thermodynamic limit here. I don't know what is the thermodynamic equilibrium, to be precise. Not the limit, the equilibrium. So in many cases, we take the pressure to be zero. 
In fact, my favorite statement by Vikshek himself is, the source of energy making the motion is not relevant. That's what he said. Unlike physics, we do not care really about the energy because we are talking about objects that they have their own source of energy. So what's the point? I partly agree, but partly disagree. My statement is, yes, I do not look at uh, a thermal equilibrium, but I still insist that there is an entropy inequality, namely the fluctuation of the, 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 the level of fluctuations, remember that we look at fluctuation, cannot increase. So there is a one direction in time such that the level of uh, fluctuation should decrease. I insist to impose that a priori. The reason is, if the level of fluctuation increased, well, it's not realistic. I don't know where the energy comes from. In fact, I don't care and I don't know. But I know one thing. The level of fluctuations will not increase. So I impose what I call this kind of entropy inequality. And with this, I will have to live. So I will continue. I will stop here. I will continue with the statement as follows. We will take any pressure as long as it does not increase the fluctuation uh, of, the, of the system. I don't know what this pressure is, but it will not increase the fluctuation of the system. And the remarkable thing is that without knowing what the pressure is, it turns out that the alignment itself will overtake this pressure and will give us the large time behavior, independent of what the pressure is. The reason is that in all these models of alignments and collective dynamics, what really matters are just fluctuations. Okay, let me stop here. And I will continue in half an hour with the conclusion of this saga. Okay.